Hey guys, welcome to another video. This is Gar from TechFit. Um, today we are going to look at something uh, really interesting again, and which is uh, data processing toolkit. Again, within this data processing toolkit, what I want to kind of like cover uh, different areas. Like again, I've been working in this uh, field for the last eight years, and based on my experience, what I think it's uh, quite useful um, to know while you're actually building your machine learning models, and what are the best practices that you can use to actually do data processing beforehand. So without wasting any more time, uh, I'll give you some sort of summary first where we are looking at first pandas. Within pandas, I'm actually going to not go in detail on showing all the functions that Panda Library can provide you, but also just showing the, the functions that are quite relevant when you're working in this field and that functions that you would use um, you, and you're more likely to use, to be honest. Then also I'm going to dip onto Dask. Again, Dask is really useful if you are working on machine learning models and how you can actually um, increase the speed of your code. Again, when you're working on Python, scalability and all these factors kind of like play in and especially when you're training your models they, it's all the things or matters is like the time and duration how effectively you can train a model so that's what we are going to dig into more to task again I'll show you a really basic example where I'm using scikit simple computer and how uh, we can make that computation 18 times faster using Dask. So that's the kind of like idea because again Dask would be using parallel computation where it divides them into different cores and it processes them more faster and I'll give you more detail when I talk about the topic Dask and then finally we are going to look at the new release uh, which was this Panda site table. Uh, we, we are going to look at a couple of examples where we can how can we use simple liners of Panda site table and how useful they are when you're especially doing your EDAs. So without wasting any more time, let's start digging into all these three topics and I'll leave the times right now here. If you are looking for something specific, if you're just here for those specific topics, you can jump on the, these timelines on the video. If you like the video and you think I've earned your thumbs up definitely click on that like button it definitely helps me to grow the channel and subscribe to the channel as well perfect so First thing you're going to look at is pandas. Again, within pandas, first thing is, so especially when you're building machine learning models, you will be looking at some key functions that are really useful in pandas. So what I want to kind of like cover in this uh, video is that what are the key functions that I think are really useful to know when you're starting something like uh, building your own machine learning models and what are the, the things that you will be doing beforehand to actually process your data. So first thing we are going to look at is reshaping, how you reshape your data to actually make it in a form that actually would be easily uh, used in building those machine learning models. So initially what I'm trying to do first is I'm trying to load all the dependencies. I have all my dependencies and I have two CSV files. Again, within those two CSV files, one has 100,000 rows, the other one has 40,000 rows. So what I'll do first is I'll actually show you the head of the first table. As you can see within that table, each row kind of like represents that it's a sale which has uh, which has its own attributes. So such as what are the, the city or date or nationality, car type or car model, where the car was sold. So these kind of all the information are which are attributes within the table and each row has its own ID which basically represents the sale. Now, first thing what I want to look at is kind of like uh, basically making that information which is on a row level, actually con combining them or you can call it more like reshaping them and looking in a summarized format. So what I want to do is pd dot pivot table, uh, I will look at the table itself which is df1 and then the columns would be car make and the values that I want to kind of like show within these two entries is first which is car model year and the car price. Now again what I want to do is I don't want to sum them or count them, you can actually do that as well but I want, what I want to look at is the mean values for both of them so my aggregated functions would be car model year which is the np.mean so I'm using numpy for that and then the car price which is numpy.mean mean as well. Now yeah, fill that value is equal to zero. So what I'm trying to do in this is I'm trying to look at if you see the answers now 
now so where we have the car make what are the cars that are the, the car makers are there based on that what I want to look at is what's the mean year for the car model year for the car make and what's the mean price for all the cars that are being sold by that car maker so that's uh, one of the things that I wanted to look at perfect so that's done so next thing I want to kind of like reshape my data for my machine learning model so some of the times when you're working on different machine learning models one thing you might have to reshape your data in a from that say for an example if you have one row at that row has column called gender where we have male and female but that's on a row level and you want to convert and you want to make gender will convert into two columns which means gender male and gender female and if the, if the, the gender is male it says one for that and it's female it says zero because it's only one value out of that row so to convert into that format i'll show you one easiest way when you're using pandas so what i'm going to do now is for initially i'm selecting my columns that i want to do that practice on which is my id car make and gender and country code again i won't be doing that on my id i'm just using that as will be my the indicator for that row and then i'll be using to do this uh, function on just on the next three columns so I'll do pd.getdummies now getdummies is a function which helps you to do it more easier uh, so data set column is equal to gender and then car make and country code so as you can see once I do data set data head so where I'm looking at my IDs where all the IDs are within the same row but then again my column value which was just gender now turned into gender female and gender male which again a lot of times you do have to turn your data set into this format especially when you have your categorical features and you want to actually look at the values in this format for your machine learning model this will be the easiest way just to convert them through using pandas okay so next thing we are going to look at is merging so merging is another topic that I think would be really interesting because especially when you're working on machine learning models there are a lot of times you would be kind of, you would be combining two different data set again to get more features now in this example I do have two different data set one data set has 100,000 rows the other data set has 40,000 rows again they do have different features but there is a joining key which is the ID which is again for one table it could be a primary key and for another table it could be a foreign key or it could be a primary key as well uh, what I'm trying to do in this scenario is I'm trying to join them to actually get more attributes so one thing it's really useful especially when you're working on machine learning models is if your data set is in a different format and maybe in different SQL tables and you do want to combine them together and basis on the basis of that you actually want to build more features this would be one of the easiest example to do it in Python so for this I'm going to do is data is equal to pd.merge df1 and df2 which is my two data set and how is equal to left that means I'm doing a left join and then finally on I'm going to do it is on ID now I'm going to also look at the length on the data just to kind of show an example on the left join it's 100,000 rows because one of the data set has 100,000 rows which is my DF1 as it is a left join now before actually kind of like going I had more I want to explain different joints as well just if somebody else is coming from a different background and they don't know about different types of joints so I'm going to actually import this image again which is in my current directory uh, okay so within this image as you can see so I've explained four different types of joints that you can actually do through pandas merge function so first join is which is an inner join where again you can actually you can see the two circle represents two different tables one table is zoo and the other table is zoo eats now once we join them between the id and if it's an inner join rather than being a left join you can see all the values that exist in the middle which is highlighted in dark green they're the values which will be shown which means if your values are ident identical IDs between table one and table two, only those values will be shown. If it's an outer join, doesn't matter if they are if they are same or if they're different, all of them will be shown. So for an example, if you have IDs in one table and the IDs in another table, and if they don't match, but they will both will show and if the, the relevant information which is just, which is not there in the table two it will be just shown as non-values then again when you have a left join what it will show is as in the zoo table all the entries which do matches with the zoo eats those values plus the values which doesn't match at all all of them will be shown as well similarly with which is vice versa for the right join so anything which is there in the zoo eat will be shown and plus the values which are kind of like equal in both the tables which is basis of inner join and then the right join which is your all the values that are not matchable so this is kind of like really basic understanding of how joins work which you can actually use through merge function so another thing that I want to show within merging is as well is one which is the values which exist in table one and doesn't exist in table two I only want to kind of extract those values and see which are those values 
which you can also do by saying something like data one is equal to df1 and then you can have this tilt sign which is then df1.id dot is in df2.id so if i do a data one that had these are the values that are actually in table one but they don't exist in table two so one more thing I want to look at within pandas is kind of like subsetting, selecting. So I want to kind of like cover these small uh, sort of like functions that are really useful again when you're especially doing your EDAs, which is your exploratory data analysis. So within that, I'm going to actually show you a couple of examples first before rather than just talking over them. So it's more like I'll select my ID and city dot head. Now what I want to do within my data set, I actually want to look at only the uh, 0.5 uh, fraction of the data. So you can actually select that by looking at this function, which is df sample and fraction is equal to 0.5 okay so another thing that I want to look at so this will show you obviously the 50% of the data set so and then I want to look at also if say for an example within my data set I do have duplicates and how can I actually remove them I can just do df1 dot drop duplicates and that will just remove all the duplicates within my data set so the next thing okay so I, how can I actually select uh, basically when I'm doing subsetting how can I actually select a certain values of the rows and how can I actually select certain columns so the the another easier way how you can actually do that is df1 and you can use ILOC and within this square brackets I can just say 0 to 1000 which means I'm only selecting 1000 rows and again it, as you're working with the index of zero is also the row because again Python in Python the index starts from zero and again the columns would be zero to three so I want to only look at first three columns then again in Python the index starts from zero that's why within the columns as well I'm not selecting one to three I'm selecting zero to three Okay, so another thing within that, what I want to also look at is especially, which is the, the small key function that might be useful, especially when you're doing your EDA. One is where I want to look at my df1 country value counts, which will show me the counts of the, the countries. Now again, if we can work them into a list format, and say for an example within my data set if I want to look at all the unique values so say for an example if in my data set I have a car make and then each row represents a car maker but I want to only look at how many unique values are there I can just say df1 square brackets car make that's I'm selecting the column dot and unique and then function call and that basically brings out all the unique values that are there in the column you can also uh, use describe function to understand what is there in the data set and another thing also you can apply maybe mean functions for say for example if you're looking at the what's the mean price on your whole data set you can do that and similar way you can do more subsetting using ILOC 25,000 rows and selecting two to four columns and uh, so, so two and four column which means I'm only selecting the columns which is the second column and the fourth column Another thing that I want to look at is actually want to um, look at the group by function, which is really useful, especially if you're doing some plots. Uh, so if I want to do something like df dot group by, and I'm looking at country and gender, and the gender has to be an aggregated value, which is I'm just counting that value for each country, which kind of like presents them into this pivot format, which is my group by function, which is again really useful, especially when you want to build some sort of plots in your EDA. So we have covered a lot of functions now like reshaping, merging, uh, subsetting, summarizing. Now one thing I'm going to actually look at, especially when you're doing your machine learning models, one thing you would also look at is missing data, how to fill your missing data. So we are going to look at a couple of different ways how you can actually do that. So initially, uh, one thing could be uh, you can actually just say uh, drop NA, which is again, if you don't really want to include any missing values, say your missing values are less than 1% and you just want to ignore them, you can just say df1.drop NA and that will drop all the NAs and basically it will drop the whole row, not just if it's a, if one column has an NA, it will basically drop that whole row, not just that column value. And uh, one thing you can also do is say for an example, if you want to keep them, but you want to just say some generic value could be zero, could be some categorical value, depending on what you're looking for. You can just say df1.fillna and then you can pass on your value. Perfect, so within my uh, data set, I do have some missing values, which is again, one I have is in country code. So I have 68 NAND values in there and I do have 412 uh, NAND values in car prices. So we'll do a couple of different variations of how you can actually fill these values. Again, it's completely dependent on what you are trying to achieve based on your own models. But one thing you can actually do is something like this where you have your car price and rather than doing fill NA by zero, what I'm doing is I'm actually filling the, the max value of the whole column. Now again, it's just one of the examples that I'm trying to show and you can actually pass on any value that you are interested in. Um, so once I do that, 
Okay, so we got, we're going to look at one of more uh, imputation that you can actually do, especially to fill your missing values. So for this, I'm actually going to import a library called Scikit-Learn, which is again, especially if you're working on machine learning models, you would be using these libraries more often. Uh, so within this library, what I'm trying to do is I'm actually trying to create this imputer, which is a simple imputer. Uh, missing values is equal to np. So wherever I have this missing value, which is the non-values, uh, what my strategy is, because again, uh, my uh, the function that I'm trying to apply this is on is on a categorical function. Again, you can actually maybe fill the missing values, which could be median or which could be mean. But in this case, it is categorical feature. So what I want to do is I want to just apply most frequent value that's there in that column. So once I do that, and uh, which is I'm going to just convert my data frame, um, my data is in data frame and then import dot fit transform df1 and finally what i'm going to do is i'm just going to change the value so within this computation again as you can see this computation will take around maybe 20 seconds to do it on 100,000 rows again it's only 63 values that are missing in this uh, data set so which will what we'll do is for those data set is that actually fill that value with most frequent value because again this is just a categorical feature and i just want to fill in something that's more frequent in my data set. Okay, so now we have covered a lot of different topics within Pandas, but now it's time to move on to Dask. Again, I'm really excited to show you the result that comes out of using Dask, and I hope you enjoy this section as well. So within Dask, what I want to do is first, I want to kind of like give you a small bit of intro on what Dask actually tends to do. Again, so as you can see in the descriptions of Dask, scheduler scales to 1000 nodes, clusters, and its algorithm have been tested on some of the largest supercomputers in the world, but you don't need to have a massive cluster to get started. Dask again shifts the scheduler design for use on personal machines. Many people use Dask today to scale computations on their laptop using multiple cores for computation and their disk for access storage. Again, Dask is built and natively to Python ecosystem, which again is really useful, especially because we are using, in this example, we're using Python and that you can use actually Dask, which is quite similar when you're using a library of Dask and when you're coding in it, you can see like it's built kind of like similar for the same ecosystem. And what I, what I want to show within this example also is the more popular language, especially when you're doing data science. And as you can see in this blotter right here, these are kind of like number of questions that are being asked on Stack Overflow. Again, this slide is from Dask itself. So what I'm trying to show in this slide is, uh, which is again, I think it's really interesting to see how uh, Python has been growing throughout the years and it's becoming more popular and popular day by day. So again, Dask is kind of like built within the same uh, similar ecosystem for, for Python. So especially when you're using Python, uh, Dask could help you do a lot of your heavy lifting, especially when you're building your machine learning models and a lot of the, the computation takes a lot of time because again, that's one of the problem with Python, which is scaling, but Dask can actually help you through its multiple uh, processing to, to on different cores. So without wasting any more time, let's dig into one of the examples which we looked at before, which was simple com uh, imputer, which we use for uh, basically filling in the missing values, which took around 20 to 30 seconds to fill in that missing values. And so we'll do the similar example by using Dask. Again, the Dask will be using scikit-learn package in the background, but the only difference of using this methodology is that you're basically defining the nodes, which is your computation nodes that you want to use uh, while ex executing this query. And if you have four cores, what we'll try to do is it will do them parallel processing in all those four cores and it will make them more faster. So initially first, what I'm going to do is I want to import my a library and then import client progress. What I'll do is I'll do a client call because I'm calling the, the Dask uh, scheduler. Uh, within that, as you can see, once you do that, what I want to do is I, I don't really want to mention any type of memory, but you can actually mention a memory within that client call that how much memory you want to align to your Dask function. But in this case, I want to just align all the memory. So as you can see, I have four workers, four cores, and the memory is 34 gigs. That's my memory for my computer. So once you click on that link within the dashboard, it brings you to a new local host link where you have your task manager for Dask. So once you execute your Dask code, it actually represents all the information while the code is working. So within this, what I want to do is I want to import this dask.data frame, which is DD. Again, the idea is that we are not really importing the data set upfront. What we're trying to do is we're importing it as a metadata, which is dask.data frame as DD. So within that, I want to read CSV, which is the same CSV that I have, which has 100,000 rows. 
So for this example, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use Dask and I'll be using similar function of scikit-learn, which is the simple imputer, where what I want to do is I want to fill all the missing values for a categorical feature as the most frequent value. So for this, what I want to do initially is that I want to impute a current imputer function from scikit-learn, which is from scikit-learn impute simple imputer. And then I'll create this function and fill in the value and then my strategy is most frequent, which means if the categorical uh, column the value whichever is more frequent just basically put that value in and then and then after that I'm just fitting that into my data frame and just converting them into a data frame as well so once I basically initiate that as you can see the, the function is running uh, it takes around 19 to 20 seconds approximately so depending on obviously like how much data I have but in this case I have 100,000 rows so what I want to do now is I want to do similar function which is again just uh, uh, basically a version of scikit-learn uh, simple imputer but basically it's been uh, created in dusk uh, so what I want to do through this is just to kind of like prove how much faster you can make your code so what I'll do is import dusk ml dot impute and then dust um, basically ml dot impute and then you have the similar function which is simple imputer and the strategy and everything and login as you can see the features and then the, the values that you're passing are exactly same as well and I'll, I'll be applying it on the same feature as well so and uh, once I do that I'll do fit transform now again where I want to kind of like put more effort in this is if you see as an example so when you basically use a uh, DASTA data frame you're basically importing the, the metadata of that data frame you're not really importing the CSV right away even when you actually do import read CSV as a metadata you can actually see the head on it and you'll see there's no values being shown because again you haven't really computed that process yet so how you actually compute the DAS processes by calling your compute function so in this case once I've applied my function I'll do is uh, df which is my data frame which is the metadata dot compute once you do that then basically DAS starts computing it and as you can see it's already been finished again it takes around 1.3 seconds so as you can see if I compare this function with the other function which was just scikit-learn so uh, simple imputer and then if you're using DAS which again uses the same simple imputer from scikit-learn so you're basically running your code 18 times faster if I look at the fraction of that so you're you're, you're basically uh, running your code more effectively so again especially when you're working in uh, machine learning um, when you're building your machine learning models and when you're coding that in your Python again you do face um, if you're working with larger data set to actually scale Python but using DAS you can actually do that as well so even if your system does not have like that much of memory but again because you're doing in parallel computation you are just making your code more faster to run especially when you're coding for machine learning models and you're building your code in python one of the issue is you, you can't really scale python code but especially using the task you can actually do that as well you can make your code more faster and as we saw just one simple example of filling missing values we made that code run six 18 times more faster similarly if you're doing maybe for a different computation again if you look at the documentation with the uh, task underscore ml for DAS itself you will see there are a lot of different functions especially for your EDAs or especially for uh, data processing which you can use for your machine learning models and they do have computation uh, basically compilers for your different models as well say for an example if you are doing time series analysis you want to build XCBoost regressor you can actually apply uh, the, the library itself for XCBoost regressor and then you can actually use the DASC version of the similar model and you can see how much faster you can run your model and you can basically make a call on that like if you want to use task or not but I definitely do recommend to actually dig more details into it and actually maybe try and apply this because I have used this before especially on a larger data set again this is just under thousand rows and uh, 20 second or one second doesn't really show the difference but especially when you're working on million rows how fast the code can run especially using tasks and especially I would focus more on using it for machine learning which is again they do have full API for uh, 
I can learn they have a lot of functions that are being converted and you can use it through DOSC. The three key areas that they cover at the moment is Pandas, NumPy and your scikit-learn. So I would definitely put more effort on then you should actually look at more documentation and try apply that and see yourself what you can actually achieve through this. Perfect, so we have covered a lot of different areas from Pandas and we have covered DAS. Now what I want to kind of like focus for last uh, couple of minutes of this video is actually look at more of the Pandas site tables where with this site tables what I want to kind of like show is how you can actually use these one line of code to actually understand your data more better rather than actually running multiple functions in Python to actually understand your data. So initially what I want to do is I want to do a, something like df.stb which is a site table.frequency country and as you can see it builds this plot where you have your country, you have your count and then the percentage of that count and then you have your cumulative count and cumulative percentage. Now without any doing any calculation you just have these values and you can actually maybe use something like threshold 50. So what I want to do in this example to you is show me the 50% of the data how is that getting created based on the country. So which country is at the top which actually consolidates into 50% of the values. So I want to do that thresh is equal to 0.5 and rest anything that's there that just goes into the other label which I want to note it as rest of the states. Within another example, what I want to actually do is I'm going to look at the car make and in this case, I still want to set my threshold as uh, 0.5 and then the value in this, I want to use that as car price rather than anything to do with counts and then style is true. And as you can see, you can have your car make and what's your car price, what's the percentage of that and what's your accumulated car price and then your accumulated percentage that actually entitles off your values. And then finally, one thing which is really interesting as well, especially when you want to find missing values in your data frame, you can just run the simple liner, which is df1.stb.missing, which kind of just shows your missing values that you have in your data frame. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it helped you in some shape or form. If you think this video earns that smashy like button, definitely give it a thumbs up. It definitely helps me to grow the channel and do subscribe to the channel for my future upcoming videos within tech and fitness. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.